Lord's Supper. I'm going to read Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 33, which is Mark's account of Jesus' death on the cross. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, put it on a reed, and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to him come to take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, he cried out like this and breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. As we partake of these emblems, let us remember the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that sacrifice giving us the hope of eternal life. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Please bless this bread which represents his body which died there for us and for our sins. And please be with us as we partake of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now take of the cup. Bow with me. Dear Lord, please bless this cup, which represents your son's blood, which was shed for our sins. Be with each of us as we partake of it. So we do so in a manner and pleasing manner pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. It's great to see you all this morning. Great to have another opportunity to worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. I appreciate <coughs> Brother Jack's song selection. I appreciate that last song um, because we truly need to think about how well things are with our soul, uh, especially in times like this. Our scriptural text is going to come from the book of James. The chapter is 1, and the verses are 2 through 4. That is going to be our scriptural text on this morning. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. There the Bible reads, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Brethren, when we stop and we think about the day and age that we live in, we see that we live in a time where God is not a priority, nor is he even a thought in the minds of many. And as Christians, living in such a world brings forth its challenges. It can cause us to lose sight of what is truly important. It can cause us to uh, get caught up and, and lost in the ways of the world and adopt the mentality of those who are truly not spiritually minded. But thankfully, we have a God, and thankfully, we have holy scriptures that provide clarity in times of need and provide us guidance to get through any and every situation. So with these things in mind, this morning, we will be studying the subject, which our title comes directly from verse 3 of our scriptural text, and that subject is the testing of our faith. The testing of of our faith. And there are three things that I would like to bring to our attention regarding this topic. Three things, and then the lesson is yours. The first of which is this. Meeting various trials is unavoidable. Meeting various trials is unavoidable. I want us to notice the opening to this letter. Just two verses in, and James hits his audience with these words. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now we have to understand that here James is not telling us to look for or to find joy in the trials we face, nor is he saying that we must enjoy our trials. But what he is trying to get across and what we must understand is he wants us to consider our mindset when going through these trials. He is saying that we should look at our trials from a different perspective. He is telling us that we must look at our trials from the right, from the correct perspective perspective. Now what, tri now, what trials <coughs> is James referring to? Is he referring to the trials as in temptations to sin uh, that he later makes mention of in James chapter 1 verse 13? No. He is simply speaking of the trials of life. Health trials, family trials, work trials, financial trials, and trials that are exclusive to followers of Christ. Trials of the soul, meaning those trials that come about for no other reason than simply being a Christian. Brethren, there are going to be trials in life. And I want us to consider the fact that James says when we meet these trials. We are to count it all joy when we go through various trials in this life. It is not if we face trials. It is a matter of when we face trials. And when that happens, we must have the right mindset. Because we know, as sure as we are today is called today, there will be a time where, we will tr where trials will come, will come our way. And brethren, we all understand and we realize that COVID-19 is certainly a trial. But what will the result of this particular trial be? We know this, along with many other illnesses, can result in our death. But as Christians, should we be afraid to die? Should we use all of our strength, all of our energy to hold on to this life and fail to realize that those who hold on to this life are simply not prepared to lose it? God says that we must be prepared to lose our life. In fact, he says in Matthew chapter 16 and the verses 25, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Most people generally follow rules for good health and self-preservation, 
meaning they avoid things that could hurt or jeopardize their body. And in all reality, there's nothing wrong with having such a mentality. There's nothing wrong with not doing things that could harm you or doing things uh, that, that are good for you. But as Christians, we must consider what is best for our soul first. That is what should be of utmost importance in our lives. When we think about the apostles, consider the apostles before the resurrection of Christ and consider the apostles after the resurrection of Christ. What was their attitude before Jesus rose from the dead? Let's say in the garden when Jesus was arrested. What did the apostles do? They talked a good talk and they said that they wouldn't flee, that they would be, they would be always by his side, that they would uh, you know, be right there by Jesus. They would go to him, go, go to death for him. But in reality, what happened? They fled. They avoided what could be physical persecution, what could jeopardize their self-preservation. Peter said that he wouldn't deny Jesus. Yet it was Peter who followed Jesus at a distance, being safe enough that he would not physically suffer any harm. This all, of course, was prior to Christ's resurrection. But after Christ rose from the dead, what was the attitude of the apostles? What was the attitude of Peter? We see examples like in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 where they, they counted themselves joyful. They, 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 they were rejoiced in the opportunity that they had to suffer for Christ's namesake. You see, at that point, they realized that the spiritual was more important than the physical. They realized that what was good for their soul was better than what was good for their body. And even though these Judaizing teachers told them no longer teach in the name of Christ, well, they said we should obey God rather than man. Even if that brings forth physical persecution, we will not stop following God. We will not allow our souls to be in jeopardy. Jesus said losing our lives for him will result in eternal life for us. And brethren, the elders have seen fit to take the precautious measures necessary to ensure our physical well-being and our safety during this time while focusing on what is most important, that being the well-being of our souls. We should rejoice and we should be thankful that we have the opportunity to worship the Lord our God. We should be thankful that we have elders who saw fit to take the precautions necessary for us to worship the Lord our God. Because worshiping him and the well-being of our souls is far more important than any physical well-being we may have. And unless Jesus comes first, death is a bitter, bitter pill all will swallow. But the death of the soul is an even worse pill that is only swallowed by choice. And those who choose not to put the spiritual before the physical are taking a great risk. Brethren, the scriptures instruct us to count it all joy when we meet any trial. What effect will the coronavirus have on us? More importantly, what effect will the coronavirus have on our souls? Will it result in the death of our faith? How about the death of our commitment to Christ? You see, the day that we are living in, uh, they're, they're, the frequent thing that I hear often is people say that there are new norms right? There are new norms. Masks are going to be uh, the new norm. Uh, limited occupancy is going to be the new norm. Lines outside of stores and businesses is going to be the new norm. And these things might be the new norm for the time being. But brethren, we have to remember and we have to understand that the abnormal, it is abnormal for a Christian not to follow Christ with a spirit of complete submission and commitment. We cannot expect a world without God to think in ways that benefit a relationship with God. No matter what we are going through, no matter what we are dealing with, we must look for the good that can result from it. Because all trials, big or small, all trials test our faith and can either make us better or bitter. As we proceed through this coronavirus pandemic and this COVID-19, all of these restrictions and everything, we can either allow it to make us better or we can allow it to make us bitter. Brethren, I pray that none of us allow it to be the latter. I pray that we all remain focused on the Lord. I pray that we always strive to look 
for the, uh, what, the, what we're going through, what the trials that we face, can, how they can benefit our lives. You see, this is an opportunity for us to show our God and to show those around us who need to see the light that a commitment to Christ does not change and will not change because we understand the value of keeping Christ and we also know the result of losing him. This world is not expected to stop living because of a pandemic and neither is the Christian expected to stop living for Christ because of a pandemic. We have to remember that Christianity is not part-time. Christianity is not something that we do when it is convenient for us. This is a lifestyle. This is a commitment that we have chosen to engage in for the rest of our lives. And when our faith is tested, we must respond accordingly. So meeting various trials is unavoidable. Our second point on this morning is this. The testing of our faith is useful. The testing of our faith is useful. And there is an incorrect way to respond to trials. Whenever those outside of Christ meet various trials in their lives, many times they look to blame God. Many times they lose faith or trust or belief in God. And oftentimes they also throw a pity party. But those of us who do possess a right relationship with our Lord are probably guilty of responding in similar ways as well from time to time. Now, the wrong way to respond to any trial is to be unable to see past the trial, to be unable to recognize the good that this trial may bring. These trials that we go through in life will bring pain. They will bring heartache, and they will bring stress. But the wrong way to respond is to fail to remember who is in control and what we have to lose if we lose sight of him. James also records that the testing of our faith produces. That word produces means results in. So we can say the testing of our faith results in steadfastness or endurance, but only if we overcome the test. This is the proper mindset that we must have. This is the proper perspective that we must have when we are facing our trials. To understand that there are blessings that can result from enduring those trials. The result of a tested faith is endurance. Have we ever heard the saying, I'm sure all of us have, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. But as Christians, we can go a little bit further. We can tweak that that quote, and make it a little bit better. And we can say what doesn't kill us makes us stronger in the Lord if we allow it to do so. Again, this result only comes if we overcome the test. Because there are two possible outcomes for any test or trial that we face in life. Either we pass or we fail. The more tests we pass, the stronger we become in the Lord. But on the opposite end of that spectrum, the more tests we fail, the weaker we become in the Lord. When we think about Israel, wasn't that what happened with them? They were facing these trials in Egypt. They cried out to God. They trusted in God. God brought them out of Egyptian bondage, brought them to the Red Sea. And then what was their response? They didn't have faith. They didn't pass the test. They said, God brought us here, and now we're going to perish. Because this, this sea is before us, and the army is coming. But then God parts the Red Sea. They go through on dry ground. God closes the Red Sea, kills Pharaoh's army. And then God intended to bring them directly into the land of Canaan, but they failed the test. They said, oh, well, we cannot take these people. These people are too big. The walls are too high. So they failed. And as a result, they wandered in the wilderness. Brethren, we need to learn from Israel's example. We need to learn that if we pass the test, we become stronger in the Lord. But if we fail the test, we become weaker in the Lord. As we age, we understand that we will lose physical strength. But that does not have to be the case spiritually. As we age and as we mature in Christ, we gain the strength necessary to continually endure. What helps us pass the test in school? Being prepared and being determined to pass. When I was going to college, 
or right before I went to college, I had to take placement tests, you know, so that they knew whatever, you know, math courses or whatever to put me in. And I was decent at math. I wasn't the best, but, you know, it was a, it was a subject that, you know, I, I was okay at. And I remember taking this placement test, and, and I had been prepared to take this test, right? I mean, all this knowledge that I had gained in high school, you know, it, it, all this that I learned, I could apply to this test, and I could, you know, move forward and continue my uh, education mathematically in college. Well, when I had to take this placement test, I really didn't care too much about it. I figured, oh, well, I'll just be put in the average, um, you know, college course, and, and, you know, it'll be fine. Well, I took this test. And I really didn't try. I knew what I needed to know. I possessed the knowledge necessary, but I wasn't determined to pass it. So uh, they, I took the test. They put me in uh, basically, you know, elementary, junior high level mathematics, right? And this was stuff that I already knew, but I went to the teacher after and I said, hey, you know, I already learned this stuff. I know how to do all this. Is there any way that you can just kind of maybe write me a note or send me a pass that I can move up to, you know, the, the, next, the next class? And uh, she said, no, you have to take the placement test again. If you want to move up, you have to take the placement test. So I had to retake this placement test, and I was determined that time to actually pass it. I was determined to get through it because I said, I don't want to sit here and go through this stuff that I learned years ago. I just want to, you know, just continue learning and continue growing. And as a result of putting forth that effort, that, that was the case. And when we think about being prepared and when we think about being determined, if we are prepared as the word of God so perfectly does for us, and if we are determined to maintain the proper perspective, knowing that any trial that we go through has the potential to make us better, brethren, we will never fail. Turn to the book of 1 Peter, the chapter is 1, and the verse is 7. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, we'll begin in verse 6. It says, In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Brethren, this verse not only speaks to the value of our faith, but also points out that our tested faith can result in in praise, glory, and honor at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First and foremost, our tested faith uh, and our desire to overcome will bring forth praise, glory, and honor to our Lord and King, Jesus Christ himself. But our tested faith can also result in praise from the Lord towards us in these words. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Matthew chapter 25, verses 21 and 23. It can also result in glory that Christ is willing to share with us, provided we are willing to suffer for him, and when he returns, be glorified with him, according to Romans chapter 8 at verse 17. And it can also result in honor in the form of a crown of righteousness. So you see, brethren, the testing of our faith is useful. And meeting various trials is unavoidable. That's going to happen. And our third and final point on this morning is this. The end result of steadfastness is becoming undiminished. The end result of steadfastness is becoming undiminished. You see, steadfastness develops spiritual maturity. We cannot grow from babes in Christ to mature adults in Christ without being steadfast. It takes time. It takes endurance. And when we think about being steadfast, when we think about this word steadfast, and when we think about the word endurance, let us also consider the word constancy, which means to be unchanging and to be unwavering. And the idea is to see the storm coming. Stand in the direction of that storm and remain there, standing our ground until the storm passes over. And as we struggle against the difficulty, as we struggle against the opposition that the storm brings, our spiritual stamina for future trials will be developed and strengthened. If Robert 
were to be standing in such a storm, that, that, that wind could probably move, move him pretty easily, right? But if I'm standing right behind him, now he's a little more grounded. You see, when he is by himself, he is not strong enough to keep himself grounded. But if he has someone bigger behind him, he can be better grounded. And when the wind comes, it will move him, but it will be harder for that wind to move me. And the same is true in a spiritual sense. If we are leaning against God during the storms and the trials that we face in this life, brethren, we will, in fact, weather them. We will weather all of them. But we have to have and we have to keep trust in our God. We can become undiminished or complete if we stay the course. Just like staying in school and continuing education results in in achieving various degrees, so also does staying on the path that leads to heaven, overcoming various trials, result in us being complete. Our endurance through trials will eventually bring us to a point where we are no longer spiritually lacking. It will cause us to become what God needs us to be. If we remain steadfast through various trials, if we do not give up, if we allow these things to make us better, we will be changed for the better. We will be complete. We will grow to a spiritual state of maturity where we lack nothing. But brethren, we have to heed the words of James because if we do not let steadfastness have its full effect, then we will not reach this point. And brethren, God would have us to reach this point. God would have us to go through these trials and become better on the other side. So how do we deal with the current pandemic? And how do we allow trials to strengthen our faith and not weaken it? Well, the answer to that is by remembering who is in control. Remembering who it is that we serve, and remembering why we serve him. Why do we serve the one and only God, the creator of all the universe and everything therein? Because he is that one and only God. Because he is omnipotent, omnipresent. He does have the powers that only God has. And we know that if God brings us to it, he will in fact bring us through it. He will bring us through anything that we go through, and we can grow stronger as a result of what is before us, or we can lose faith and grow weaker. Where do you stand on this morning? Do you stand strong in the Lord or weak without him? Brethren, when we think about the coronavirus, when we think about anything that we have gone through, in our lives, when we think about the struggles that we face, the trials and the tribulations that we go through, we have to understand and we have to keep in mind that this too shall pass. No matter what it is that we are going through, no matter how long it seems, it seems like forever, that you know this is going to go on forever, this too shall pass. The words heard this day from the word of God should have an effect on the heart of the Christian. And for those who are not Christians, may the Lord give you the time you need to reflect on where you are headed. And if you have realized that that is towards an eternal separation from God, that outcome can be altered this day. You can make things right with God. You see, if you are not a Christian, you have the opportunity to become one. And becoming a Christian begins with hearing God's word, which you have done, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Being willing to repent, turn away from the evil in your life, turn to God, allow him to be your guiding light. Confessing Christ to be the Son of God, being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, and rising up to walk in newness of life. As I have said before, I say again, this is not what I say needs to happen for man to come into a right relationship with God. This is not what the the believers here at 32nd Street say must happen for one to come into a right relationship with God. This is what the scriptures teach. This is what God himself says someone must do, anyone can do, in order to have a right relationship with God. And if that is you on this morning, you can make things right with God. You can have a relationship with him by obeying the gospel. But maybe you're here and you are a Christian. Maybe you're here and your faith has been tested, as all of our faiths 
have and will be tested. And you've allowed these tests to uh, just, just kind of blind you to who's really in control. You've allowed these tests to, instead of make you better, make you bitter. Well, you have the opportunity to make things right with God as well. You have the opportunity to pray to God and ask him for forgiveness. You have the opportunity to repent and have a changing heart, a change of mind that leads to a change in life. And you can ask for prayers on your behalf from your brothers and sisters in Christ. I say it all the time, and, and I say it because it's, it's something that we need to not allow to go under the radar. I say it because it's something that we should not overlook and that we should not take for granted, but we should take advantage of the opportunity that we have, those Christians who have a right relationship with God, the opportunity that we have to pray to God and to pray to God not only on our behalf, but on behalf of those around us, behalf of other Christians, on behalf of those in the world who have yet to name Jesus as their Lord and Savior by obeying the gospel, to pray for those in the world who are suffering because of what is going on in the world today. But you know what? There is this great pandemic, but you know what's a pandemic that's even worse and that has been going on for even longer? The pandemic of sin. People are so comfortable with sin. We cannot allow that to be us. We cannot allow ourselves to be comfortable with sin. We cannot allow sin to blind us to the point where we just are accepting of it, thinking that we will be rewarded in the end anyway. That's not what the scriptures teach. We have to be committed to God. We have to overlook uh, the ways of the world, and we have to focus on what God would have us to focus on so that we can have the home that he has prepared for us in heaven. So wherever you are on this morning, we ask that you make a wise-hearted decision while together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.
bow with me. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity we had this morning to hear a portion of thy word and sing praises to thee, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the congregation we have. Dear Lord, we're thankful for Carlos and his lessons he brings us and the elders and servants here, dear Lord, and pray that you would be with the elders as we go through these times and as restrictions are put on our worship services and pray that you would go with them and help them continue to find ways that we may continue to worship you. Dear Lord, we pray that you'd go with us as Christians and we'll take Carlos's lesson to heart, dear Lord, that we we will not be distracted in our our service to you, dear Lord. No matter what's going on around us, dear Lord, we pray that we'll always, our main focus will be towards you and that we will strive to have a home with you in heaven. And dear Lord, we pray that we will not forget that our our goal as Christians is to bring others to you, dear Lord, and and through restrictions, it becomes a little more difficult, but we know that there's always a way to continue to spread your word and bring those closer to you. Dear Lord, we pray that you would be with those who are sick and unable to attend. And dear Lord, we pray that you'd be with those who are traveling, you get them to, their des- to and from their destination safely, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we... As you continue to go with us, guide us, forgive us when we fall short. In these things we ask in Christ's name, amen.